It was December 1972. International Falls, Minnesota, lay placidly under a couple of feet of very soft white snow with temperatures hovering near 20 below. My pastor husband, Mark, was performing a wedding for a young couple who thought it would be so romantic to get married around Christmas in an area where snow and cold temperatures would be guaranteed. They thought it would be perfect to leave the church in a horse-drawn sleigh and head down to the reception. The only problem was a groom who was not from the area and was not familiar with horses or driving a sleigh pulled by a horse. Mark watched them pull away from the church with the groom hanging onto the reins for dear life, pleading, no, not so fast, whoa, no, whoa. Oh, I was not at the wedding, having plenty of fun at home on a Saturday night, <clears throat> bathing and putting my three kids under five to bed by myself, but I was treated to a Mark Tristan enhancement of the whole wedding when he got home. Another memory I have of that year was as peaceful and quiet as the other event was noisy. Our third child, Sarah, was baptized by her father at the midnight candlelight service at Zion Lutheran Church. Just seven weeks old, she lay as still as she could be, taking in the beauty of candlelights and soft music. If you listened hard enough, you might have heard the angel voices announcing again the birth of God's Son. When we think of Christmas, we often have a picture of a tree full of presents, joyous family reunions, lots of good food, and of course, preceded by a candlelight service at the church. For many of, these ideal, for many of us, these idealistic thoughts don't materialize. In fact, many families don't have enough to eat, let alone have presents. This year, many are sick with COVID or have family members who have died from COVID. We eat alone. When I was 13, my father, who was the one who played catch with me in the backyard, or took me fishing or hunting, or took the neighborhood kids to the Eveleth Golf Course to go tobogganing, and on the way home got everyone an ice cream cone. That father dropped me off to get a haircut in my hometown of Virginia, and then drove to Minneapolis for a meeting for school administrators. He suffered a severe heart attack while there, and I never saw him alive again. My life was never the same. Christmas was never the same. And I want you to listen to parts of a devotion that my husband Mark shared a few years before he died. She was a world famous singer, giving concerts mainly in the US and Europe. Often she would accompany herself in her violin, which was made by one of the best in the world. After one of her concerts, she noticed the soundboard was cracked. Distraught, she packed her instrument up and flew to the old man who had so carefully made it. Yes, it can be fixed, he assured her. But now, your violin will speak with its own unique voice. It is only after its soundboard, its heart, has been broken and carefully repaired that it sings most beautifully. Careful examination of the great violins of the world reveals that the soundboard has been broken and repaired on most of them including many of the great violins made by Antonio Stradivari, and even the finest violin in the world, the Alard Strad. I wonder if there isn't a little parable about life, growth, suffering, and most of all, grace in all of this. Some of the deepest love I have been given, the most understanding, compassion, forgiveness, kindness, deepest camaraderie I have shared has come from folks whose hearts have been broken and carefully mended. From people who have known suffering, who have walked through the valley of the shadow, who have experienced personal failure, loss, brokenness, or death. It's not the suffering that makes the difference, though. Anne Morrow Lindbergh, a well-known author and wife of a dynamic young pastor who died suddenly at a young age, stated, everybody suffers. Suffering won't make you any better, but suffering mixed together with love and patience and understanding and a continued vulnerability, that can lead to a new birth. There is a key to all this, this broken heart and beautiful music. St. Paul put his finger on it. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, 
and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which God has given to us. The psalmist wrote, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Words of Jesus, I will be with you always. Behold, I make all things new. There it is. It is he who initiates the healing, the caring, the coping. He who surrounds us with love and understanding. We are all brothers and sisters in suffering. Our sound words have been cracked or will be. Our hearts broken or will be. But know this. Our suffering can be an occasion for growth, for renewal, for new sensitivity to others, and for greater reliance on our Lord, the Christ Jesus, whose life and death and new life is the most beautiful song of all. And he invites us to let that song of love, hope, and joy, of caring, sharing, and kindness, and of forgiveness reverberate off our sounding words, broken but lovingly repaired by him for the sake of those he places in our lives.